Okay, so moving on now to more humanistic approaches to psychology. Um, essentially, the humanistic approach is based around the idea of positive psychology and personal growth. Uh, so the f uh, fundamental philosophy of uh, humanistic psychology is that all people are driven to achieve their fullest possible potential. Uh, and what this means is that people are constantly striving to achieve more, to gain more, um, but to do so in a way that isn't necessarily malevolent or narcissistic or selfish, but to do so in a way that achieves what they could fully become um, in life. Now this um, philosophy is underpinned by the belief that people have free will, um, and this might be uh, placed at odds with uh, some of the earlier philosophical approaches to psychology. So the behaviorist approach, for example, um, assumes that a stimulus can automatically lead to a, res a response, or the cognitive approach believes that the way that we process information, maybe to do with the brain or, uh, or something else, drives how we behave. Now the humanistic approach believes much more in free will in that behavior is not determined, but we come to decide what we wish to do and when we wish to do it. Um, human nature, according to uh, the humanistic approach to psychology, requires and necessitates an understanding of the experiences of people. Um, now what this means is that the uh, typical approach to studying uh, psychology or to studying behavior from a humanistic perspective relies on a method called phenomenology. And we'll look at what that is towards the end of the video. Um, but the most fundamental point of humanistic psychology is that the most appropriate or the most relevant level of analysis when looking at a humanistic approach is to study people at the level of the individual. So to use an ideographic approach. Now this is really at odds with some of the earlier approaches in relation to behaviorism, for example. So if you were looking at one group versus another, that's a nomothetic approach to studying behavior. Whereas an ideographic approach is to look at one individual at a time and see how they're behaving. Now the uh, most well-known, the most renowned humanistic psychologist uh, that has ever lived is Abraham Maslow. Uh, most people have heard of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this idea of a pyramid or a triangle where you have the kind of basic needs at the bottom in relation to food, water and warmth. Um, you have safety needs above that and then from there once you feel safe you can start to feel love and belonging which gives you self-esteem. And then if you have self-esteem, then it gives you a, a springboard for reaching your fullest potential, which in uh, the verbiage of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the achievement of self-actualization. Now, most people have heard of this uh, model to studying kind of behavior and uh, how people seek personal growth. Um, it may uh, surprise some people then to realize that Maslow never actually drew a pyramid. Uh, so in a recent book called Transcend, uh, Scott Barry Kaufman, who's a, an American psychologist, uh, reformulated Maslow's theory. So what he did was he pointed out the fact that Maslow never actually drew a triangle, never actually drew a pyramid. Um, and the way that the hierarchy of needs is set up, uh, if we just quickly go back, is that you have kind of these levels of needs. So once you've achieved all of your physiological needs, then you move on to safety needs. Once you've achieved all of your safety needs, then you move on to belongingness and love. Now we know that life doesn't work like that. We know that sometimes you might be in a loving relationship, but then lose your job, for example, which makes it much more difficult to, to have food and water and shelter and things like that. Um, so it's not the case that you have these levels that you kind of unlock the next step of life. Um, what Kaufman suggested was that maybe a sailing boat might be a better uh, way of viewing how we seek self-actualization or, or transcendence, as he said, was the, the highest form of uh, personal growth. Now, in this sailboat analogy, what Kaufman suggests is that we all need safety, we need to have connection, and we need to have self-esteem. We need to believe that we can achieve something. We need to have connections with other people, we're evolved to be social uh, beings, and we need to have safety. We need to be able to know that we've got somewhere to sleep at night. We've got somewhere that we can have not just physical safety, but emotional safety as well. Um, and that kind of base level of um, our needs is referred to as the security base needs. Now, what that means is that once you've got a, a secure boat, which is the bottom of this sailboat analogy, you can then start to chart your course 
uh, through the sea of life, which we know is choppy, we know is unpredictable, um, but you can open your sales, which is the growth needs, um, to start to explore, to start to seek out loving relationships, and to explore your full purpose in life. Um, I would really recommend uh, reading Scott Barry Kaufman's book, Transcend, um, as he kind of maps out what this looks like in, in practical terms, but with reference to a lot of the, uh, the most recent evidence in relation to humanistic psychology. The next video that's gonna follow this um, will just very quickly uh, show you Scott Barry Kaufman talking about his uh, new approach to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People get a lot of things wrong about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. First of all, Maslow never even drew a pyramid. <laughs> a lot of people might not know that. Uh, you'll, as you are probably very uh, used to seeing a diagram on Facebook or in your introductory psychology class or management class, you'll see this pyramid um, with self-accusation at the top and, and different needs. Well, I looked through Maslow's writings and he never actually drew a pyramid to represent his theory. He actually viewed human, to, it was very clear to Maslow that life is not a video game. It's not as though you reach some level in life like safety needs and then you, get, you, you reach the safety needs and you get a certain number of that and then some voice from above is like, congrats, you've unlocked connection. And then you go, do, 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 and you move up to connection. And then, and then and, you know, it's not how life works. And Maslow was very clear about that. And in a lot of ways, Maslow was a developmental psychologist at heart. He really believed that human development was constantly this two steps forward, one step back dynamic. We're constantly choosing the growth option, and then we're failing in some way, or we have some struggle, which is an inevitable part of life, and then we continue forward. It's not, life is not some trek up a mountain, and then you reach self-actualization as though you've, you've, you've achieved self-actualization and, and, you, uh, and, and the, the final credits come on, you know, like the video, again, the continuing the video game meta metaphor. Uh, life is not like that. Self-development is a process. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it's, a, it's constantly in a form of development and we are constantly becoming. Uh, our being in the world is constantly becoming. And Maslow is very clear about that. Abraham Maslow made very clear that self-actualization is not the same as achievement. A lot of people, in fact, may achieve quite a bit in their lives and maybe on the cover of magazines, may have all the awards, they have the whole trophy shelf of their house that they show off and still feel deeply, deeply unfulfilled. We, are, we feel much more fulfilled when we actualize our potentialities, our, our deepest potentials, um, the things that make us unique, the things that we can uniquely contribute to the world in ways that have a positive impact on the world. Just realizing your talents without the context of the meaning behind it is a recipe for a lot of talented people to live a very unfulfilled life. So Maslow defined self-actualization as becoming everything that you're capable of becoming and um, that you're most uniquely capable of becoming. So we have a lot of things, a lot of potentials that we share with other humans. So we have the need for safety, we have the need for connection, we have the need for respect and uh, a certain level of feeling worthy or self-esteem. And we share that with others. But Maslow thought of self-actualization as those potential potentialities within you that are most that if, if grown to full full heights will have the biggest impact on the world uniquely. What do you most uniquely have to contribute to this world? I think that's how Maslow really thought about self-actualization. That's how I tend to think about self-actualization as well. So I've revised Maslow's hierarchy of needs for the 21st century, building it on a solid scientific foundation. So my revised integrated hierarchy of needs views human development as in a process of higher and higher levels of integration. So instead of some trek up a mountain, we're actually a whole vehicle. We're an integrated set of parts. Our whole can become greater than the sum of its parts. But how we integrate those parts is really important for fulfillment in life and ultimately transcendence. So many people might not realize, but towards the latter, years of Maslow's, Abraham Maslow's life, he 
he was working on a new theory of transcendence, arguing that our highest motivation in life wasn't self-actualization, but it was actually transcendence. What is good at the highest level of, uh, of human development, the highest level of human motivation, transcendence, what is good for oneself is automatically good for others. So the notion of selfishness breaks down. In fact, at the highest level of consciousness, we have a lot of dichotomy transcendence, as Maslow put it. Things such as evil versus good no longer makes any sense. They're all part of an integrated whole. Selfishness, unselfishness doesn't make sense because what does it mean to be selfish when what is good for you is simultaneously good for society? What does that even mean anymore? So in my revised hierarchy of needs, I, I argue that a better metaphor than a static pyramid is a sailboat. With a sailboat, we absolutely need to feel to have a boat that is safe and secure or else we don't go anywhere. If you have a huge leak in your boat, you're not going, you're not going very far in life or on the, in the ocean. But we also, but having, being safe and secure and having a, a, a secure boat is not enough or else we won't go anywhere. What we need to do is we need to open up our sail as well. And when we open up our sail and we feel very comfortable and safe enough to open up our sail, we can really move through the ocean in the direction that we want. Usually it's in a purposeful direction. We have some sort of meaning or purpose in life. But as we're moving, we're still moving in the, in the vast unknown of the sea. And the truth is we're all in this together. We're all in our own boats going in our own direction, but we're all in the sea. We're all in the vast unknown of the sea, especially in this time we're living in right now. We all see quite clearly how choppy these waters are. But it's important that we recognize that while safety is important in these unknown times, we must not neglect our higher possibilities in life. They're just as important. Now what you can see that Kaufman's done there is really revolutionized the way that we view humanistic psychology and totally revamped Maslow's hierarchy of needs in line with the most recent evidence on uh, transcendence and self-actualization. I'd really recommend uh, checking out the book Transcend, but also looking at some of his podcast interviews on the Psychology Podcast um, to show how Kaufman really takes the uh, the work that he's interested in in terms of humanistic psychology and applies it to different areas of work. Now moving on to how humanistic psychology has an effect on or an application in mental health care. Uh, humanistic psychology is really the bedrock of modern counselling psychology. Uh, so Carl Rogers is someone who is uh, renowned for developing this type of uh, approach to mental health care. And what he suggested was that uh, counselling approaches should be person-centred. So again, looking at people from the level of individuals. Now the fundamental principles of Rogerian person-centred counselling is that people should have congruence with their clients. They should really be able to empathise and, and identify with them on an emotional level. They should have the same goals for the treatment. They should have the same kinds of approaches that they think will be efficient for that type of therapeutic relationship. And they should have an unconditional positive regard. So they should be um, trying to affirm the most positive aspects of their client's personality and helping them uh, to care for themselves, to engage in self-care um, and understand why they're coming to uh, that client therapist uh, scenario with the issues that they do rather than trying to diagnose a problem to fix. The idea is that the therapist and the client work together towards a solution. Now this is uh, really the fundamental uh, philosophical underpinning of modern approaches to psychotherapy. So things like acceptance and commitment therapy, compassion focused therapies are based around this idea of unconditional positive regard, of empathy and congruence, and the idea of personal growth rather than trying to fix a problem. Now just to close, uh, we know that phenomenology is the, uh, the main way that humanistic psychologists will work to understand human experience. Now this really relies on the on a, a real focus on lived experience. So phenomenology really is the focus of how people make sense of their own lived experience. What people will typically do when they're engaging in a phenomenological research methodology is they will try to interpret the narratives of people that they're trying to understand. 
Um, they'll get lots of rich data through interviews, typically using uh, either unstructured or semi-structured interview schedules. Um, and the, the aim behind this is to try to develop an understanding, a really deep ideographic understanding of each individual, which you then can bring together to identify themes within a broader group. So these are known as superordinate themes. Um, what people might do then is use those themes to identify potential avenues for, for further research in a nomothetic way. So you might be able to use those phenomenologically gathered themes to form a hypothesis to test in a nomological way. Now this is a really useful technique to learn, um, and a really useful uh, technique to be able to enact it when you're working with people who are uh, coming from hard to reach populations, or if you're just trying to chart out a new research area where you don't have any firm hypotheses, but you might be interested in how people make sense of their experience to formulate those hypotheses for yourself. So really the fundamental thing behind this is that people who are coming from a humanistic tradition are focused on ideographic personal narratives rather than group-based nomological approaches.